What's up, party people? Let's see if we can do this. There's a question that's incredibly difficult for Christians to answer when asked by non-believers. Not because the answer is complicated. It's actually pretty simple. But it's a hard pill to swallow because it's simple. All of our beliefs rest on it. It's quite literally the bedrock of our worldview. And the question is, why do you believe what you believe? The answer is that Christians believe what they believe because they've been given faith in the living God of the Bible who wants to be known by his creation. So he reveals himself to us and gave us the Bible as a record of all the ways he's made himself known to mankind. So it's really simple, straightforward answer, but non-believers reject this as authoritative because they don't believe in God. I heard Pastor Jim Wilson say in a book on evangelism that the Bible says it's a sword. And so if I came into a room with a sword and said I was going to have your head, you could say that isn't a sword, but I would still have your head. So Christians have followed truth. It's led them to belief in Jesus Christ, the total and ultimate revelation of God to the world. At the end of the day, if we put our faith in Jesus, then we believe in the Bible. What I'm trying to do in this video is talk about some aspects of what Reformed Christians hold to be true about the Bible. And I'm deriving that from the 1689 Baptist Confession. I wanted to tackle just one paragraph from it today, chapter one, paragraph one on the chapter on the Holy Scriptures. So we'll read the paragraph section by section and tackle what it says. You might be thinking, that's cool, Brad, but why does it even matter? Well, Jesus claimed to be God, and he also pointed us to the Holy Scripture as the standard of our lives as the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God fulfilled. So if that's the case, then the answer to the question, who is Jesus, is massively important. As C.S. Lewis so succinctly puts it, Jesus is either a liar, lunatic, or Lord. Either he was not God and claimed to be, which mean, makes him a liar. He thought he was God and he wasn't, which makes him a lunatic. Or he was exactly who he said he was, Lord of everything. In fact, Christians stake their entire belief system on the fact that Jesus came to earth as the Son of God, died on a cross, and was resurrected. Jesus conquered death because Jesus was God. So if that's true, then we can believe him. Not only can we believe him, but we should take him at his word that the Holy Scriptures are God-breathed and intended for mankind to be able to get to know the living, triune, relational God of the Bible. This is the core of what it means to put God first. It's a posture of humility and hunger. Humility to know that we're not God, and a hunger to know who God is and how we can live obediently to him. Every belief that's grounded in a Christian worldview originates with the idea that we believe in the God of the Bible. If we don't use the Bible as the standard, then the question is, what could we possibly replace it with? In fact, I think this is why Reformed Christianity is so impactful. At the core of the Reformation and Reformed theology is the belief that we always go back to the source, the Bible, where we humbly and respectfully seek for the truth. In fact, if we often read and study the Bible, we can almost become desensitized and forget the very simple message of the gospel. We can forget that we're broken, sinful people who have been forgiven by God. Why do you think Paul spent most of his letters fighting false teachers and spelling out good theology and how to apply it to our lives? Because we're easily distracted. The key is to bring it back to two very simple questions. Who is God? Who am I? When we get even a hint of the holiness of God, a hint of the depravity of our own souls, and even a hint of the life-giving power of the blood of Jesus, man, things just seem to get a lot clearer. I chose the Baptist Confession because I grew up Baptist, and even though I'm uh, attending a Presbyterian church now, I still I still lean alert, uh, blah, 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 still lean a lot towards Baptists. But it's very similar to the Westminster Confession um, anyway. So, question is: Is the Bible enough? I wanted to encourage people to think about this very foundational topic. There are many huge questions that spin off of this when you think about it. Like, is the Bible the Word of God, inerrant, infallible, and inspired? Do I even know what those mean? If the Bible's the ultimate authority, does that mean that it's just Christians who should follow it? Or does it apply to everyone, whether they believe in it or not? Or if we don't believe the Bible's perfect, that we need to change our understanding of it, then what standard do we use to make that determination? Or how about this one? If we can't use the Bible as a standard for our entire lives, then what do we need to add to the Bible? I hadn't thought much about these questions until I really started digging into my faith. I wanted to know where my beliefs came from and why I believed them. And ultimately, it, it led me back to Jesus and what Jesus actually said about all this stuff. And spoiler alert, Jesus thought very highly of the scriptures. His life was a play-by-play -play fulfillment of the Old Testament. And the New Testament is his life story and what we learned about Jesus's life and his fulfilling of the scripture. So where do you get your beliefs and worldview? Many atheists and agnostics think Christians get their beliefs and morality from religion. So is that correct? Or should we argue that point? Do Christians get their beliefs from their parents, from their church, from the Bible? 
Now that's an important thought experiment. I guess they would get their thoughts and beliefs from the Bible if their parents in church were living out what the Bible taught and teaching it faithfully. And it definitely would not be the case if someone's parents in church were not living and teaching it faithfully. I mean, these are big questions, and I won't be answering them completely in this video, but I wanted to get people thinking about these issues on their own, maybe giving them a reminder that how we understand everything has to do with our worldview and beliefs. Everyone has a foundational set of beliefs about the cosmos, about the world, and their place in it. And that worldview has massive implications for how we live our day-to-day -day lives. That's the foundation of our thinking and acting in the world, really. What we actually believe, if we believe in God, then that's our first assumption, God exists. We then have to ask, well, what type of God is he? And can we know about him? Christians stand out in this regard, and the God of the Bible is unique among all other religions and deities in some important ways. I think the biggest way that the living God of the Bible is unique is his triune nature, which I talk about in a different Theology Thursday video, but because God is triune, he's relational in nature. He reveals himself to us. So the first question, is the Bible inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of God? Is the Bible God's word spoken to us, or just a collection of books about God? For a succinct view on this, I'm going to go to the 1689 Baptist Confession, which says this about the Holy Scriptures. Paragraph 1 actually has four sections, so I'm going to go through it one chunk at a time. But the first chunk says, The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. What does that mean? The historical Orthodox understanding of the Bible is that it contains every single thing that we need to shape our worldview and understanding of how the cosmos and entire world works. The Bible is God's word, and God's word is truth. Do people act like they believe that today? I mean, this became a serious issue for me as I was questioning my, my own faith and struggling to make my beliefs my own. I mean, I had a lot more questions. The Bible says God created the world in six days. Does that have to be literal? Does it have to be translated that way? Is this a poem? The Bible says God told Israel to kill women and children. Is that moral? Is that a problem for me? Is that incompatible with my idea of who God is? The Bible says God's holy, and those who are sinners and imperfect and blaspheme the Holy Spirit will be destroyed and thrown into a lake of fire, among other descriptions. The Bible says that Noah saved all the animals from a global flood that lasted 40 days. Our materialist worldview has definitely shaped how we as Christians read and interpret and want to understand God's word, and I think we really need to acknowledge that. You know this is true if you've ever been embarrassed or ashamed for believing something the Bible teaches like the creation narrative or the flood. You know this is true when believers or non-believers act like it's insane to believe what the Bible tells us is true. My pastor growing up used this illustration. Everyone has a lens, and when we look at the Bible and the world, we have a choice. We can look at the Bible using the lens of the world, or we can look at the world through the lens of the Bible. But our perspective matters. We either have a biblical, godly worldview or not. If the Bible's inspired, inerrant, and infallible, then we should live that way, don't you think? So the second part of the confession, chunk number two, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave man inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and his will, which is necessary unto salvation. So this chunk goes on where, where we left off in the first section. It says that if we look at the world through the lens of the Bible, we'll be okay. But if we look at the Bible through the lens of the world, there are going to be a lot of gaps. God created the world, so as we look, even materialistically, we see God's fingerprints and signature all over the place. There's no excuse to not know that there is a creator, a God. But if we only use the world in our own heart and mind, we will not be able to fully understand who God is or how we can fulfill the purpose we were created for. And this section basically says that God gave us enough clues and hints in the natural world to point us towards him so that no one has an excuse to rebel against him or deny his existence. But the natural world in our own heart, precisely because we are sinners, won't reveal what's necessary to be saved from ourselves, from our own sinfulness and rebellion. And this is a transition to chunk three, where the confession says, Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diversified manners to reveal himself and to declare his will unto his church. This section reiterates that God's relational and wants us to be able to know him. It pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diversified manners to reveal himself. So that means throughout history and through the natural world, he's given us evidence of himself time and again with promises and providence over and beyond anything we deserve, all to reconcile his creation to himself for his glory. So he's providing and sustaining the church and his believing community throughout time. So chunk number two and three explain the mechanics and chunk four of the confession brings all of it together. How did God do that? Through the Bible. Chunk number four says, and afterward for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world to commit the same holy unto writing, 
which makes the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing His will unto His people being now completed. So this last section shows us that God used the Bible to that ends, and specifically to help us avoid the pitfalls in the natural world and our sinful nature. It's a measurement. It's a standard. We can turn to it. We can learn it, and it will help us. Help us establish the beliefs of the church, avoid the corruption of our own heart and of the flesh, our worldly desires, to avoid the malice of Satan in the world, and to give us a record and a history, a shared story of the Father God who created us and sustains us unto his final judgment and glorification. I think that's an important point to reaffirm for many Christians today. Look, I'll be the first to admit I was ashamed of some beliefs I had been taught growing up until I looked at the alternative. If we don't use the Bible, then what standard do we live our lives by? Our own heart? Gross. The Bible in Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And I've seen that play out in many people's lives. As someone who questioned the Bible and its claims to truth very actively and critically, who's been ashamed of my beliefs at various times, who's questioned the truth of the Bible, I can say that we need now more than ever to understand that the Bible is how God chose to reveal himself to us, which means we have to be unwavering, steadfast, and faithful to read and understand how to live cheerfully obedient lives to God's standard. Why? Because Jesus showed us who has the ultimate authority and power over death. God's word is the standard for us, for our family, our church, our governments. Many people today spend more time introspectively asking themselves how they feel, but that can be a deadly mistake. Literally, look at the depression and anxiety and suicide happening in the world today. Jesus is the answer. So I'll leave you with these final questions. If somebody asked you why you believe what you believe, could you honestly answer the Bible or would it be something else? Do you believe that the Bible is actually God's word and do you live like it? Do you feel like you turn to the Bible to understand how to live your life the best way? Look, I'll be praying for you and your families and thanks for hanging out. I'll catch you in the next video. All right, peace.